There, there was a, a history of law enforcement in our family going back to the beginning. Oh. We've been chasing bad guys out of Montana for five generations. <laughs> and you want to go back to Congress and that, yeah, and that, and that mess, lifestyle? Right. That <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Jaeger came here just to help me run. So, oh, that's, yeah, thank you, Jaeger. Yeah, and Ricky's helping from, from Africa, you know, she's yeah. making videos and stuff, so got the whole family well, involved. Uh, the Helds really have some roots here in this, in this state. So yeah, it's thanks, kinda, Mike. kind of interesting to see it. Hi everyone, my name is Ricky Held and I'm going to talk a bit about the Held v. Montana uh, youth climate lawsuit, uh, my own involvement, how I got involved, and um, where this case is at now, and as well as other climate litigation going on. So uh, Held v. Montana was filed in March of 2020, and um, it's filed by a 16 youth plaintiffs. And we uh, filed against our state of Montana for contributing to climate change and harming us plaintiffs and um, acting unconstitutionally. Um, and we're represented by three law firms, um, McGarvey Law and the Western Environmental Law Center in Montana, and then also Our Children's Trust, which has a bunch of youth-led uh, climate cases around the world. Um, there are two federal cases in the United States and then different state ones, um, such as in Montana. So a quick backstory about me and, and why I'm a plaintiff on this case is um, I'm from Broadus, Montana in the southeast corner. And there my family um, has a ranch in the Broadus Motels. And um, I feel very lucky to have uh, gotten to grow up, uh, grow up on the ranch and just be a part of the ranching operations. Um, moving livestock and building fence, um, haying, all that, and, and being around my community, learning the history and values there. Um, I'm really interested in environmental science. I studied that at Colorado College, and right now I'm teaching science, um, the sciences, biology, and chemistry to secondary school students in Kenya. Um, but I really found my love for science um, working with hydrologists who have studied the Powder River that runs along my family's ranch. Um, they've studied since the 1970s. And so even when I was little, I got to go out with them and do topographic surveys of the river. And I got to connect that science with my own home. Um, so I've been interested in earth systems and climate change for a while, but we also have to act on that science. And so um, when the opportunity came to be a plaintiff on this case, um, it uh, really felt like the right thing to do. Um, so being a plaintiff, I, I got to tell my story and everyone is affected by climate change in some ways. Uh, it might just be wildfire smoke in the air or, um, or your house flooding. Um, but I told my story of how myself and, and my family and community are impacted with things just like wildfires and wildfire smoke, air pollution, uh, extreme weather events. Um, and uh, all of these things. So submitted like, pictures and um, and then my story as well to the court and got to testify at trial. Uh, this was a flooding event that happened a few days after the trial. My dad and I had never seen anything like it on the ranch. And um, that was just from a few hours of rain coming down from the hills. Um, so there are a lot of, a lot of different uh, events like that. And even in my short lifetime, I've seen those changes happening to my home and I think it's important to talk about these stories, especially from uh, places like these ranching communities where people are so closely tied to the land and our livelihoods depend on the well-being of the environment um, so closely. Um, so yeah, these are some of the climate related impacts listed out, just uh, everything like water variability of the river that affects uh, livestock and crops and um, and just the, the ranch. So why be part of this case? Um, our Montana constitution, it, it outlines um, uh, some things like we have the right to a clean and healthful environment. And um, so just being part of this case and trying to protect those rights and those values is really important to me. And even in the constitution, it uh, talks about responsibility for, for individuals and for our state and um, acting in a way that protects um, our land and people for, uh, for now and for future generations too. Um, these are all of us plaintiffs. 
and I feel very lucky to have um, gotten to work with all of them. It's a great group, and uh, we all really care about our state and the people here and feel like we uh, this is something that we need to do to um, protect ourselves and, um, and everyone. So in the lead up to trial, um, again, we filed in 2020, um, filed our complaint. We um, did depositions, gathered evidence um, in that three year period before we got to go to trial. Uh, in this case, we, um, we wanted declaratory relief from the court. So we wanted the court to say that um, our state was acting unconstitutionally um, and violating our constitutional rights, such as to a clean and healthful environment. And then also um, a stable climate system um, is included in the right to a clean and healthful environment. Uh, we specifically challenged two statutes. One was the Montana State Energy Policy, um, and that was repealed right before our trial because of this case. The other was the um, MEPA li uh, limitation or the in Montana Environmental Policy Act limitation that talked about um, it said that Montana cannot consider greenhouse gases or climate change when uh, conducting environmental reviews for um, like fossil fuel activities, for example. Uh, there was a lot of state resistance to the case. They tried to get it dismissed eight times uh, before we finally got to go to trial. Um, but we did get to go, and this was the first ever youth constitutional climate trial um, or climate case to go to trial in the U.S., and uh, we had a full week of plaintiff and expert testimony on the case. Uh, there's a lot of media around it, um, and plaintiffs got to talk with media outlets if we wanted to tell our stories and talk about the case. And people from all over the world have reached out to me in support of what we're doing. Um, so with um, these are some overviews of the plaintiff or expert testimony. Um, and all of our experts did this uh, work pro bono or without pay because they um, so strongly believe that this is what needs to happen. Um, and so our first expert, Mayna Nalingson, um, she was the youngest delegate at the 1972 um, Montana Constitutional Convention. She helped write the provision, um, uh, the right to a clean, healthful environment. And she, in the courtroom, said that the environment is no longer clean and healthful. She also talked about just how every day Montanans um, helped write that constitution, like ranchers and, and clergy and educators, businessmen, politicians. And um, so that constitution really represents uh, what we value and, and part of our history. So we're trying to carry that forward now. Um, and uh, just to summarize quickly, um, uh, some of our different expert testimony. We had climate scientists talk about climate change. Um, we had um, scientists talking about glaciers in Montana or um, freshwater ecosystems and how that's impacted by climate change. Um, also, just about how um, indigenous issues and um, how things like traditional practices and ceremonies have been affected by things like extreme heat. Um, that have infected people being able to attend those events. Um, also, experts talked about um, just the impacts to the mental and physical health of children, especially because uh, youth are um, disproportionately affected by climate change. Uh, for example, just air pollution and more extreme heat. Um, and youth will also experience the impacts of climate change for uh, longer. Um, so, and then one other thing is um, uh, just the feasibility of transitioning away from fossil fuels toward more renewable energy systems with uh, wind, water, and solar by 2050. And Montana can do this and it would save people money. Um, and so that expert testimony was great. And um, I was really excited that the science got into the court record and, um, and the ruling was based on that knowledge that we have. Uh, so for asks, um, we had that declaratory relief. Um, and, um, and one thing with the science is that uh, the scientists said that a stable climate system is equal to 350 parts per million of atmospheric CO2. And, um, and right now we're at around 420 
parts per million. And so we need to bring that back down where we already have dangerous levels of um, climate pollution in the atmosphere. And so we can't keep uh, increasing our state emissions. Um, so I think that's really important because some of the thresholds like the 1.5 degrees of warming talked about in the Paris Agreement, that's a future level of warming, um, but we're already experiencing the dangerous impacts uh, now. That's just the Earth uh, energy balance. If you add more energy into a system, it's going to affect a lot of different spheres. Um, one question that came up in court is, do our actions matter? The state was trying to argue that this is a uh, global issue and Montana is only one state that can't solve the whole problem itself. Um, one great quote from Dr. Stephen Running, he's a Nobel Peace Prize um, winning climate scientist who spoke at trial. Um, he talked about how significant social movements can be started or often started just by one or two people. And so for me, uh, during trial, I was thinking about um, just responsibility a lot, like how as individuals and states, we have responsibility to take the actions that we can moving forward. Um, and that will lead to ripple effects, of course. So with the ruling, um, it was um, just unbelievable. And uh, Judge Kathy uh, Seeley, she ruled in the favor of us plaintiffs and um, agreed that Montana was acting unconstitutionally, uh, contributing to climate change, um, and that every ton of greenhouse gas emissions matters, um, that we need to get back to a stable climate system. And um, yeah, so it was, the ruling was broader than we could have really hoped for. And it was um, it is legally binding as of now that court order is put into effect and the state tried to get it stayed, but we're unsuccessful. Right now, um, the state has appealed the case to the Montana Supreme Court. It was at district court. Um, and so right now we have, we're filing briefs back and forth, uh, but we'll go into or, or, oral arguments sometime this summer. Um, and that will be this case. But right now, um, this, uh, this was the nation's first ruling that declared laws um, prom promoting fossil fuels unconstitutional, uh, which was really exciting, and it did make uh, some systematic change. So Montana cannot continue its actions, um, increasing the state's greenhouse gas emissions uh, that lead to climate change and affect us youth plaintiffs. Um, so that's really exciting, and Montana does have to follow that court order and the Constitution. Um, and uh, we expect that this case will um, affect future climate litigation. Some of the other cases going on with our Children's Trust are um, is, uh, this summer, the, another state case um, in Hawaii will go to uh, trial, which is really exciting and one to look out for. And that's against the Hawaii Department of Transportation. Um, and they're hoping to get to zero emissions in the state by uh, 2045. Also, uh, there are two federal youth constitutional climate cases. Uh, one is Juliana versus U.S., and they filed in uh, 2015 and have been trying to get uh, to go to trial for those nine years. Uh, right now, the DOJ Department of Justice, um, they are in their 22nd attempt to kill the case. And so if you want to support that, um, you can email the Biden administration um, or the DOJ and um, just support that case going to trial um, because no other case in U.S. history has faced that level of government persecution. Um, and it's really important that these stories can be told and the science listened to when we're making, um, making these uh, decisions that are going to affect everyone in our nation. Um, and the other one is Genesis uh, versus EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. That's California youth. And um, and what they're saying is that the EPA um, has been discounting the economic value of their lives and futures of the youth plaintiffs um, because they make decisions on how much um, climate pollution they allow us to emit. Um, 
And so that's obviously affecting youth more. So those are a bunch of cases to look out for. Um, one thing I want to point out is um, just recently the European Court of Human Rights, they had the first uh, internationally or successful international uh, court ruling on climate change and um, just saying that countries do have an obligation to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions to protect people. Um, so that's a lot of successful climate litigation happening in the world right now. And there's a bunch of um, other ongoing um, cases, which are really exciting to see, but there's a long way to go. And um, working on this case, what's been really uh, encouraging for me and what gives me a lot of hope for the future is working with so many amazing people um, working to um, protect us now and for the future. And um, so that's been great to see. And we need people from all perspectives and backgrounds working on um, challenges like this in the world. Uh, for climate change, you need people like ranchers and lawyers and businessmen and art, uh, artists and writers all working together and, and adding our own um, um, just what, what we can, our inputs and perspectives. And um, so I guess just with that, um, I hope that can, uh, helps carry some conversations forward and all we can do is keep taking the next steps. So thank you for having me talk.